Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I was asked by a viewer to appear with Jelly Bean in a video since I had Honey in a previous one. So she's out here. Maybe she'll wander into the into the shot. Uh, she might just appear in all her affectionate glory. She's got a really sweet disposition. Uh, she's got a unique personality that really tends to grow on you. She's what you call a Jenny. She's the same female breed of donkey. Uh, not the same in appearance, but uh, the same female breed of donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on, which is one reason why I love caring for. Now in a recent video, I said that I would do somewhat, or try to do somewhat of a review of uh, 1 Thessalonians, sort somewhat of a recap, so this will this, this video will c conclude our study through this marvelous epistle. Now I spent some time going through, I took screenshots of each chapter and I highlighted and in, in, uh, 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 color-coded uh, a few phrases, words, uh, highlighted um, what God had done uh, in one color and what we are asked to do in another color that helped to me I'm just sharing that with you just to show you how that it helped me sort of regain a an, a bird's eye view of just what we were presented in this amazing epistle we've seen uh, the gospel presented and the effects of that gospel in our lives we saw that we don't labor for the sake of the gospel in order to be redeemed, but because we are redeemed. That is consistent throughout the whole entire New Testament. That we proclaim the gospel with boldness. We're seeing Paul's concern that we be established, that is made perfect, or the word there is complete, made complete. in whatever is lacking in our faith, complete in Christ, which we are. As we went through this study, we saw that God's grace and the joy and the peace, uh, we saw that the joy and the peace that is mentioned there is that which results from, not our, our best foot forward, but it's the peace and the joy that results from that grace. The fact that we are loved by God that we are the elect of God, sanctified, set apart by God for service. Paul commended these believers there at Thessalonica for their faith, their patience, their hope. We saw that we stand unblameable before God, that God has nothing against us, that God sees us as righteous. In fact, He calls us saints throughout many of the, the uh, Paul's epistles. That the Holy Spirit comforts us in our affliction. And that came out really strong and heavy throughout this entire epistle. The reality of suffering, affliction, persecution. And that we are to be thankful that we have affection for one another. That we have a longing and a desire to see one another. And we have the return of our Lord to look forward to, whether we have walked worthy according to our calling or not. And that even now, we're being delivered from the wrath to come. Kept, guarded, preserved by God. Why? Because God is faithful. Let's, let's look close at these things. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. First of all, laboring for the sake of the gospel is not our getting God's people redeemed. We ourselves don't labor in order to be redeemed, but because we are redeemed. Therefore, our labor is not to get people redeemed. We labor so that those whom God has redeemed will hear and believe the gospel which we proclaim, which is what Christ has done, not what we must do. 
There's a difference, folks. God doesn't need our help. We see that in, in, in several examples in the Old Testament. Dramatic uh, descriptions of how that we don't help God do anything. He doesn't need our help. We're just we're privileged to be used by God to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Christ, where that when that gospel is proclaimed, his sheep will hear and believe. But the question here is what exactly is it that we are proclaiming? Is it what man must do or is it what Christ has done? The New Testament is consistent on the fact regarding the fact that the gospel is what Christ has done, not what man must do. That's the good news that we proclaim. It is through the Word of God that we are called. God, God calls us through His Word. Inviting a person to do something to be redeemed is not the calling of God. And on the contrary, it's an attempt on our part to persuade men to receive that from God which God only grants on the basis of free grace and grace alone. Galatians chapter 1. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I, I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Uh, if we back up, I believe, back up a few verses, verses 6 and 7, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And folks, I can't think of anything more horrifying than laboring an entire lifetime proclaiming a false gospel. It's not hard to see how that proclaiming the true gospel requires a certain boldness. So we have seen in this epistle that we proclaim the gospel with boldness. Paul says, chapter 2, verse 2, We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. That's actually the word with. It's the word in. The word is epsilon nu in the Greek. In the midst of much contention. Conflict. The word contention means conflict. Contest. The, the actual root of the English word is agony, to agonize. It's, it means a contest, a struggle, a grueling conflict, a fight. Figuratively, uh, it, it, positive struggle that goes with fighting the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6.12. Now, in modern Christianity, where is the religious system that is going to cause it to be afflicted? Where is the suffering and persecution? Because that is what the Bible says happens to God's children when the gospel of Christ is received as truth. And where is the comfort that God gives? The comfort that we read about. Where is it? How can it know the comfort and the encouragement we are to give to one another in the midst of this conflict? The truth is that it's not there. Modern evangelism would have us believe that this conflict, this agony, this, this persecution stems from the ungodly world. But that is not how the New Testament describes it. And this when our Lord Himself was persecuted by the world religious system of His day. The truth is that in modern Christianity, there is no religious system outside that institution that persecutes it. Because it is the very organized system which causes the believer persecution. It defines the struggle that goes with fighting the good fight of faith. 
Now, it's, it is true that much of the persecution, and I have to admit that much of the persecution that the Thessalonians endured came from the hands of pagans and cults who worshipped strange gods, gods of their imagination. But what I find interesting about that is that modern Christianity worships a god of its own imagination as well. And secondly, the source of the majority of Christian persecution described by Paul in the New Testament is of religious origin. The world religious system, which Jesus said would put us to death thinking it was doing God service. I believe God uses this world religious system to strengthen and embolden our faith. It is an undeniable truth that the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ through the early church became the target of religious Jewish persecution, a contention that was centered around the subject of Christ being the fulfillment of the law in the believer's life, which carried over into the Galatian error in which an entire epistle was written to address that error. Law versus grace. A struggle, a contest, which the church has been involved in since the beginning up until now and will continue to be until we are finally delivered from this world. And I remind you that same struggle is not only external, but as many of you know, it's internal as well, as Paul, as Paul points out in the Christian struggle of Romans chapter 7. That struggle that, that goes on, that conflict between the flesh and the spirit. In studying through this epistle, we've seen Paul's concern that we be established, made perfect, complete in whatever is lacking in our faith, complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ, whether we have come to realize it or not. How are we complete? We are complete because of what Christ did, not because we completed anything, because we can't add anything to it. Because though we may be lacking in faith, we are not lacking in any spiritual grace. I do not have one smidgen of grace, folks, that, that you didn't receive, and vice versa. Christian growth is about appropriation. Appropriating by faith that which is already true of us in Christ Jesus. We spend our entire lives doing that. Appropriating what Christ has, has procured on our behalf. So we see God's grace and the joy and the peace that results from that grace. And apart from God's grace, true joy and peace can exist. Only a false joy and a peace that our enemy, the devil, counterfeits. Many of you know that joy and that peace that only Christ gives. And because you do, you will never go back to the law which did nothing but enslave you, robbing you of that joy and that peace. We saw that we are loved by God, called beloved. You know, and it is impossible to plumb the depths of that one truth alone, that God loves us. He doesn't love you any more or less today than He did when, he, when you first came to know Him. He doesn't love you any more than he, does, he loves me. He doesn't love me any more than He loves you. But the world religious system based on human merit would have you believe otherwise. That, that this system would, would so despise us because we boldly proclaim this love of God is nothing short of puzzling. But it does. It does because it doesn't fit its narrative that the Christian must continue or, or somehow remain in God's love. Now, we are to remain in God's love. The, the phrase, if I say remain in God's love, I'm telling you to remain in the fact that God loves you. I'm not telling you that you need to do something to ensure that God continues to love you. Folks, He loves you because you are His child. He loves you because He died in your place. He'll never love, love you any more tomorrow than He does today. 
No, He loves you whether you even realize His love for you or not. He loves you whether you're walking worthy of your calling or not. He loves you because you belong to Him. Because He chose you. You didn't choose Him. So we have seen in this epistle as well as in many others that we are the elect of God. And because we are, the world religious system hates us even more. Because that doesn't fit their narrative of equality or fairness. And this because it refuses to accept the fact that it, it was when we were dead in trespasses and sins and when we were not loving God or seeking after God that, that Jesus Christ died in our place. That we were spiritually dead and had to be infused with life first before we could even believe or receive or accept Him or anything else. What I find remarkable in my trying to summarize this epistle is how consistent it is with all the other letters to the churches that we've studied through verse by verse. We've been sanctified, set apart by God for service. He sees us as righteous. And that's, that's a very difficult concept I know for many of you to, uh, to grasp. That, that, that you are as righteous, that you stand before God now as righteous as His Son, but that is a fact. You are either righteous or you're not. The new man cannot sin. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. He calls us saints. Look at the very beginning of each one of Paul's epistles. Where the, in, most, in most cases, we're called saints. This is God calling us saints. Okay, we are saints. Why do we not often hear the simple truth of this book proclaimed today from most Christians? I believe it's because they're not being pro proclaimed from the pulpit. So why are they not being proclaimed from most pulpits? Because if there were, well, I don't think there would be very many uh, congregants there wouldn't be very many attend well except us I suppose would be there which which means the congregants would meet somewhere else which in our case well they do which brings us full circle back to where we are where whereas we've seen in this epistle as well as others the Holy Spirit comforts us in our affliction We've seen the reality of thankfulness involved in all of this, giving thanks toward God and in relationship to one another, giving thanks for one another, and I so give thanks for you that we have real affection for one another, brotherly love, that we have a longing and a desire to see one another. I don't know how many comments I've read. Can't wait to see you, Steve, at the rapture. Well, ditto. I feel exactly the same. Longing, desiring to see one another, which in fact we will at God's appointed time because we have the return of our Lord here in this epistle mentioned and, and spoken of to comfort us. We're to comfort one another with these words. His return to look forward to, whether we have walked worthy according to our calling or not, whether we're awake or we're asleep, the rapture is not based on merit. And that even now, we're being delivered from the wrath to come. Kept. Guarded. Preserved. It's not even that we persevere. It's that we, God is preserving us. He's guarding us. Why? Because He's faithful. So we... We anxiously await our blessed hope. We walk as living saints in a dying world, giving thanks in all things because this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Not fighting amongst ourselves, not defrauding one another in anything, since it is God who provides our every need and He longs to fulfill every desire of our hearts. What I see when I look back on these five chapters is a picture of the Christian that bears little resemblance to much of Christian experience today. 
and it's hard not to find that disheartening. Yet at the same time, I have to conclude that the truth of God revealed here is, is the sacred possession of every believer in Christ, whether they realize it or not. And that we would be wrong to believe that these things are only true of us if we believe them to be true. That, that they are, you know, somehow they're conditioned or conditional upon our acceptance of them. What I see is the grace of a loving God that wants us to know who we are in Christ more than anything else and trust Him more than anything else. Were that the life that God desires we live springs forth from it. Everything that, that, that I highlighted as I went through here and reviewed this, every, all of the verbs, all, everything that w pertained to us doing anything was the result of that grace. Not that we adjust our lives to conform to the truth of these words, that's law but that God's Word alone, these marvelous truths alone, which many refuse to believe or accept, in a dynamic way, these truths transform our lives. That's what I see. And Paul commends these believers at Thessalonica for this. Now, it's when we reverse that divine process that we find ourselves in a state of, of uncompleteness where we lack true joy and peace. You know, there's a strange thing happens in the life of a, of a new Christian in Christ. You know, precious little time passes from when, from when he was on his knees declaring his total bankruptcy of righteousness, his worth and, and ability, until he's storming the throne of heaven, expecting that God bless him based upon his own strength and ability. You know, just shortly before, he didn't have anything to offer God. And now he assumes that his nothingness is the fulfillment of God's need. Folks, the truth is that service is the life of Jesus flowing out of us to others. Paul understood this, and God used him to write much about it. The life of Christ through us serves others rather than our lives serving others for, for Christ. Our service must come out of our new nature whereby He performs the righteous service. It's not I, but Christ. All we can present anybody is the manifestation of the old, rotten, sinful self with all of its depraved intentions and methods. However, Christ has everything to offer and He's fully competent to accomplish it in true righteousness. Just as in all other areas, just as in all er other areas of Christian life, service springs forth from truth. The truth of this book. That is why it is of the utmost importance that we continue to take the time out of our busy lives to feast upon His Word, our most precious possession. Look, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.